Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on the Mushroom Hour podcast, we are honored to be joined by Elsa Falinga. In her career as a mycologist, Elsa has described 22 mushroom species in California. Her most recent work is at the University in Jepson Herbaria at UC Berkeley and at UCSF on the Microfungi Collections Digitization Project. She received her training at the National Herbarium of the Netherlands and earned her PhD at the University of Leiden. Additionally, Elsa is a researcher and professor with the Bruns Laboratory at UC Berkeley. The main motivation for her taxonomic work is that it lays the basis for efforts to include mushroom species in nature management and conservation plans. She has proposed several species for the International Union for Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, a global database of endangered species. She concentrates especially on lepiotas or parasol mushrooms. Elsa is also an avid knitter and uses mushroom dyed yarn for her creations. I'm just honored to have her on the show and share her vast amount of knowledge. Elsa, thank you so much for joining us on Mushroom Hour. Thank you so much, Darren. And I see now that I'm really not a professor. I'm just a, a normal person in the Brunt's lab, but that's okay. <laughs> well, it's funny because you were very clear that I shouldn't use PhD, and now you're telling me, don't call me. So I think we can add that you're likely very humble <laughs> as well. Um, <laughs> You know, and there's there's so much to talk about. For this episode, I really dug into some of your work on mushroom taxonomy, because I think for folks, even with a passing interest in mushrooms, they understand that it seems like the scientific names are always in flux, you know, as we discover more and more about these enigmatic organisms. And you've done a lot of work in that field and, you know, basically dig into why fungi have the names they do. And I think you raised some great points about even pitfalls and challenges when it comes to developing scientific names. Um, you know, before we get into that, why don't you give us a little background on how you found yourself working with fungi, you know, a little bit of the story of how you got to where you, where you are today. Well, I grew up in the Netherlands, as my name tells you. Well, That I struggled so much to pronounce. Yes. <laughs> It's a Frisian name, actually. It's not a Dutch word. It's Frisian. So it's the northern part of the Netherlands. Anyway, I, I worked, I, we grew up walking a lot. And my father taught me plants. And then when we went on holidays, first, you know, close to the Netherlands, then further away. And especially the, my teens, when we went to the Alps, there were so many interesting plants. And we, we really looked at those plants and tried to identify them with my old flora book my father had from his school days, uh, which of course we failed miserably because the Dutch flora and the one in the hops is quite different. But so that installed really a love for plants and nature into me. And then I chose biology to study in college. And I kept being interested in plants just because they're really basic there. I branched out to get to know some mosses we have this, but when you start with plants, you have simple names. And then we start with mosses, the names get longer and more complicated. Hmm. And at some point uh, in the study of biology, at that time, you chose your subjects. So we did basically almost two years of research, which it comes down to equivalent of a master's here. So I, I knew nothing about mushrooms. So I decided to study those. And I went to the University of Leiden where at the herbarium, there was a famous well-known mycologist, Case Boss, and I studied with him for a while. So that's why I started it and I stuck with it. And I say, well, I still don't know anything about mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I never, got a class in mushrooms because they weren't offered so I keep learning and yeah as I said I perpetually feel that I don't know anything still there's still so much to learn and we discover so much about them I think mushrooms are a classic example of the more you know the more you realize that you don't know exactly and I think there's a big impression here in the United States among mycophiles and people interested in mushrooms and mycology that Europe has a much richer tradition of 
foraging for fungi or appreciating fungi. Was that something that was true there in the Netherlands? Was there any kind of cultural interest in mushrooms, maybe more so than you noticed when you came to the United States? Yes and no, of no and yes, I should say. Um, they are fungophobes. They don't eat mushrooms. And there was a really strong movement not to pick mushrooms, and it's still existing, actually. And their first question is never from, can I eat it? The first question is always, is it poisonous? So there's a very, very totally different attitude. But on the other hand, there is a very strong mycological society, mostly amateur mycologists, but they go really deep into mushrooms and not just the mushrooms that we can see with the naked eye. There's a lot of attention to the much smaller ones and, and groups that really inventory small areas of little forest and turn around every stick and look at every bump and everything. For instance, there are weekends where one comes and there's nobody who's there without a microscope. Everybody oh, brings a microscope, her microscope and studies what they find. They go out in the fields in the morning, come back and work deep into the night, discuss their things. So it's, it's, it's the yes and no. So in general, there is much less attention to mushrooms and a much more a different attitude. But on the scientific part, there is a much more deeper and more active group than I've encountered basically anywhere here. Different, two different things, sides of it. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, in general, there's that mycophobia, but the people who do get into mushrooms are yeah, incredibly really passionate. Deep. Yeah, yes. yes. Very yeah. interesting. Well, I guess then, how did you find your way to UC Berkeley in kind of the legendary Bruns lab? I, I've interviewed Professor Bruns on the show. So many people have gone into that lab. There's been so much amazing work that's come out of it. How, how did you find yourself there? Uh, boyfriend, <laughs> basically, my husband. My husband lived here when we met in we met in between, um, and he knew Tom, and he he asked whether I could do something in his lab. So it was in '96, and I stayed there months, and then when I permanently moved to the U.S., I did part of the uh, lab work for my for my PhD. I did that here. And then I just, I got another grant to do more research on Lepiodas at some point. And then for the rest, I just stayed and then did work in Herbaria. Yeah, so your work centered around Lepiodas. And if there's one specific thing about that mushroom, what held such a special fascination for you <laughs> uh, about <They're> Lepiodas? Beautiful. <laughs> just beautiful and they, they they have both they're microscopically beautiful just for the eye and they have interesting characters under the microscope so a lot of these bigger mushrooms like trichomas they're just so boring under the microscope <laughs> nothing but these are these are cool they have things on the surface they have cells that are differently organized and they look different and spores can look different yep there's a lot going on <laughs> well, and you've just talked about some of the features that come into play when we think about taxonomy. And like I said, your, your work has gone in a lot of different directions, but I really got fascinated about the paper you sent out about taxonomy and some of you know your proposed guidelines for establishing mushroom taxonomy, which I think can be a contentious issue in some, in some circles. So what inspired your work in looking at taxonomy? Because that's a pretty specific part of mycology. And I've spoken with a lot of mycologists who say, oh, my, you know, taxonomy, I throw my hands in the air and it's not something I get into. What, what, what made you interested <laughs> in? I don't know. I mean, that's what I like. I'm curious. I like to look things up, I like to organize things. So you wouldn't say that when you come into my house. But yeah, I, <laughs> the things that, that fit me probably, yeah. It's a certain mindset. So people who are a little bit, well, you know, trying to organize things, they are good at taxonomy. I'm not saying that I'm very good at taxonomy, but that's one of the characters, the character traits people have. Well, and it might explain why I'm not the best at taxonomy, but you've really, I mean, you've really gone in depth. And if we can, and I know, you know, this is probably courses, college courses of information, but what are some of the underlying principles basically for why fungi get the names they do? You know, what are these 
binomial nomenclature, these two-part scientific names, what are they generally based on and how are they derived? Well, in the past, it was just what they, uh, the characters they have. And then we always were fight, well, fighting. Um, there was always discussion. What, you know, what is it more important, whether all the species have clamp connections on their hyphae, so these little things that the, the nuclei go through or not? Is it whether the spores have are amyloid or not? I mean, there are questions. You never know what is more important. So there were always discussions about how do we do it? Right. And there were always these people who had a lot of small genera or, or the ones that were, no, we moved it all together and they, they share more than they differ. So there's always, I mean, it's people who make the genera, right? right. It's not really clear in nature. But with the more advanced of DNA comparisons, we get a totally different set of characters and also different ways of looking at it. So we're looking really from how things have evolved and how things are branching and how, I mean, it's like your family tree. That's what we're looking at and different methods to look at that, all kinds of things. And it is just a constantly evolving branch of science as well. It's not, you know, one set in stone yet way of doing it. Right. So when we do it with looking at family trees based on pieces of DNA, then we look from, well, are all the, all the species in the genus, are they all forming one little branch with one ancestral species where they all branch off? Is that what we have or is it all over the tree? I mean, is it all over the tree? Then we don't call that a monophyletic group and we, I wouldn't call that a genus. And when we say monophyletic, uh, just so I can keep up, what does that word mean? It means that all the members of that group, all the ones descend from the same common. They have one common ancestral species. Right. So in terms of putting together a genera of fungi, the goal, or, or in your mind, the kind of the goal should be to have all of the species that are included yeah. in that genera be part of the same branch of the phylogenetic tree. Yeah. And that would be a clade, right? Yes. And of course, it's very tempting when, you know, some of these members of this branch look a little bit different and we can recognize them from all the rest to pluck them out of it and make a separate genus of it. But then you burn left with that group that is not including all Daxa descending from this ancestral species because you have taken out this one little branch, right. this little part, this little one. So then you have a paraphyletic group, what we call. It's not monophyletic anymore. And it's very tempting to do that when you have a big genus. And there are some species that are really of a big grouping, let's say it like that. And then there are some species from some, some groups that, that really stand out and are easily recognizable. You think, oh, let's make a separate genus of it. But what do you left behind? So the other ones that you pick it out from, you pick a little bit thing out of your big pot of porridge, but the rest of the porridge is not the same anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> it's this, it's really easy to pick out the nice pieces out of your porridge, but that's not what porridge with currants is about. <laughs> we have a duck right. saying, you can pick the currants out of the, the raisins out of your porridge, or cherry picking is the other kind of, it's not quite the same. Well, I think it's hilarious because anyone who eats oats with like frozen blueberries, I can totally understand that analogy. But the <laughs> idea, the idea is if you break off some of these smaller phylogenetic branches out of this big grouping you had, you had a genera, this big genetic grouping, and you take out a piece that suddenly changes the complexion of that big grouping to yeah. make your small, more individuated genus. And, you know, I think you entered in something really interesting to this discussion when you talk about NRITS sequences. And, you know, my understanding of fungal genetics is still very nascent. But the idea being that when we are getting phylogenetic information about fungi, we're usually only taking from one or two sequences out of, you know, I don't want to say millions of being correct, but, you know, thousands at least or millions of gene sequences or um, uh, genes. So 
what are the limitations that that presents? I mean, does that throw into question the whole established phylo phylogeny? If we think, oh, that's only one gene sequence, that doesn't necessarily have the whole picture? No, no. These days, I mean, when we look at, at published phylogenies of the really big groupings, like all the agar, all the agar, all the guild mushrooms and all the russellas and all, all those things together, they use definitely more sequence data than just, they even don't use the ITS for oh. those big phylogenies. For smaller phylogenies of a small group, ITS is still used. But in many cases, that's just only for showing that the species they the authors want to describe is different from the other ones and showing where the species falls in that smaller group. But for the bigger ones, my, there's multiple gene sequences used and these days also whole genome sequences. So I'm just not just only some small bits and pieces. ITS, it's problematic. Uh, in some groups, it works really well. In other groups, it does not. It's, you know, it's nature. There is no one <laughs> thing fits all. You can't just, uh, and, and in some cases, we don't know. We still don't know how to say, from, well, this is a species and this is a population. We don't have that kind of information for most fungi. Where, how do you do that? Sorry, I'm now throwing it all totally off in a different direction. Well, that's really we'll interesting leave too, that though. For another, uh, for another podcast. <laughs> well, even in a even in a basic sense, you have Amanita muscaria, Var muscaria, present in Eastern Europe, but also in the United States. And there's been some very basic research done on just those two populations. And they're shown to have much different features. Now, I don't know if genetically how different they are, but it gets to this idea that even within what we think are this well-defined species, there could be variations. And I guess is one of the big issues where you draw the line to define a genera and a species, you know, how much difference is enough difference to necessitate some kind of new taxonomic grouping? So that's the eternal question we will all struggle with and it's humans who do it it's not we try to interpret nature and we do our best and we say this is a, definitely a new species or whatever we call it and then other people will say no or other people will say yes it's the best we can do i mean every phylogeny everything it's a hypothesis we think this is the way it went but this is the best we can do at the moment, but perhaps in five years or 10 years or 20 years, people will laugh at it and say, well, we have different evidence and this is now how we're doing it this time. Uh, it's in flux. It's not written in stone. And yeah, it's, it's humans who do it. Right. And has most of the taxonomic changes that we're seeing you know most is that mostly now based less on macroscopic features and almost entirely on genetic data there i mean is there any virtue to separating by macroscopic or is that totally been moved aside as we've gotten i, I genetic? think i think what happens is that we rely on the trees and then we look at whether the characters we see fit the tree mm. instead of the other way around I see what you're saying. That's uh -huh. most cases. And if people and in some cases there's a as a conflict. And then it is up to the person who is studying it on how to solve the conflict. So they, they can look the same, but then the, the tree doesn't follow <laughs> that. <laughs> and then yeah, in some cases one will follow the microscopic characters, or microscopic characters, and in other cases one will follow the tree. But as I keep saying, it's really, it's humans who recognize genera. We hope that species are real and existing in nature, but we don't really have a good way of recon of having characters of traits to recognize them in all groups. It's just still what we recognize. And there's a lot of discussion on that. And that was actually another question was how we then end up with the genera and species names that we do. I mean, is it Elsa and this other council of 
mycological geniuses that kind of make the final decision nope. or, or in this area of constant flux, you know, how do we land on something that everyone can agree on? Um, well, that, that last bit of your thing is one with everybody agrees on is, is the problem. <laughs> they don't. That's you know, the simple you propose answer. something or you publish it and then people accept it uh, on the evidence you say, or they don't accept it and people are free to do so. There's, again, it's not written in stone how to call you Amanita, whether you call it Amanita muscaria or Amanita muscaria variety Flavi fulvata or whatever you call it. Right. So there's kind of the discretion of whoever is later publishing, a, let's say, an identification book or another yeah. paper. They can reference a scientific thing that they believe in. Yeah. And so, I mean, when you talk about what is the correct name for something, it's consensus. And some names are published in a wrong way. So there are rules about how to publish species names. Mm. It's kind of a, uh, a book of laws. How to, well, not a book, but yeah. Well, basically, there are rules and regulations. So you have to follow some things. Sure. For the rest, I mean, it's opinion. It's your best interpretation of the characters you see. And the best, not just that, but also you have to do a lot of of literature research to see whether you what you think is new hasn't been described already. And that's the hard part. Uh, okay, so that's the hard part is making sure you're not renaming something that's already been described. Yeah. And that's very easy to do. And there are lots of examples of same species described over and over again. And then you pick the, the oldest available name is the one you use. And that, you've actually done that process it sounded like 20 plus times here in California. <laughs> so are there any specific examples of the mushrooms or fungi that you've named that, that you can share with us, maybe one or two examples and, and what that process was like for you to do some of this research and find that final name? I think it's more important to focus on the ones that we didn't describe. <laughs> okay, yes. What and about the ones one, that evaded one description? Oleoda. That's a snowbank fungus. So it grows, it fruits in spring when the snow in the Sierra Nevada melts. And we thought it was new, but painstakingly going through the book on Foliota showed there was one species that was described from Shasta, Mount Shasta, fruiting in spring. And so we got the specimen that the description is based on and sequenced it, and that sequence, the ITS sequence, matches ours of the modern collections just perfectly well. And then I also looked at it microscopically and then <laughs> realized that this species is very uh, variable in its microscopical characters. And if you have only one collection to base your description on, then you make it too narrow. But anyway, we, mm. we could match the modern collections with one, with the type, what we call the one collection where on which the name was based. And it's a pretty common species, but it, it was just forgotten. Nobody used the name for it. It was one of those issues that the things that using an old name is really very satisfactory. <laughs> so some people say, oh, describe everything as new and don't bother with the old ones. But it's very nice to use names that are, exi are already existing. So there is a school of thought that says, hey, this may have been described, you know, because there are fungal descriptions and specimens and fungal herbariums from, you know, decades ago. Uh, so, <laughs> so this was from the forties, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so there is a school of thought though that says, uh, you know, well, let's for, let's forget those and start over. I, the really old names, yeah, because when you when you can't sequence them, when, you, when it's much harder to sequence them, for instance, when they're older, when they're a century old, it gave me at least your satisfaction to couple an old name with modern collections. So I've also done it with Lepioda. They're described by Muriel more than a century ago. And I didn't even bother sequencing of trying to sequence the material because it's just so old. But the characters are so easy and you can match them really well in the description, those short bits. Of it. So it's really nice. I like using old names and looking at it. By any chance, was that Merle collection at the University of Florida? 
No, it was it was described from from his trip on the west coast. So it's in 1911, I think it was that wow. he traveled from Seattle down the coast to definitely to Stanford. Originally, he says he went to Santa Barbara, but I did never saw collections from there. So he traveled through. He started out in. Washington and then went to Oregon and then came here in the Bay Area to go and went to Muir Woods and collected mushrooms and described from Muir Woods. He was a prolific naturalist and I know that he does have a large collection from the latter part of his life when he lived yes, in Florida. Yeah, that's his, indeed his latter part and he described many species from Florida and also some several times in the same paper right <laughs> <laughs> without the genetic data it becomes yeah, hard to, to yeah, differentiate when things, yeah when things look different and you know you, it's in the human eye to see differences more than commonalities i think right yeah, i've been thinking about analogy from how do you organize your cutlery drawer for instance your kitchen drawer or your books <laughs> I mean, I put all the spoons together. I put all the forks together. I have some forks, though, that have four prongs and some have three. Do I need to now put them into separate categories in my drawer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what about your wooden spoons? <laughs> and your, well, your cutting of course, knife. those are separate. Of course. Yeah, your cutting knife. So it's material, it's shape, it's, it's purpose. <laughs> so what are your categories? <laughs> That's really interesting to hear just how much this is in flux because I think so many of us think that, like I said, this is handed down from some council who all got together and decided that, yes, this is a scientific yep. name. Uh, but the fact that there's so much debate and so much research <laughs> that has to go into it is really just great to shed some light on that process. And I've had some folks who posited that fungal barriers, some of these old collections from the 1910s, the 1920s, may actually be genetic banks that we haven't yet tapped into. Do you think that any work in sequencing fungal herbarium collections or because obviously you've had to dive into some of those collections in your own journey to to name fungi or see if fungi have already been described, but do you think there that an, a concerted effort to look at the collections in fungal herbaria may change? phylogenies or reveal that certain things have already been described? It definitely is used by, by I mean, as, as in the example of the foliota, the, the snowback fungus. So we used a collection from the 40s to, to match that with our others. And it's been done for a lot of collections, but the older ones, it depends on the way they have been preserved, whether it will still give DNA or not, right. or small fragments, and, and how do you go with it? Um, yeah, it's it's really important to do so, and it's it's a, I mean, it has to be done carefully and group by group by people who know what they're doing, and it's been done. It's been done as much as possible, but some groups the DNA just doesn't work in all the specimens. It just with the the current techniques doesn't really easily work. Perhaps with other chemicals, it will work better with, you know, some don't, just don't do it. Trichomas are a problem, apparently. And I know that in general, just mapping out file, it all comes down to data and the more collections from the more different places, the more times a year, only yeah. by adding more and more specimens do you really start to get the picture. And so I was, I was intrigued by that idea that we could pull some of these old collections into yeah. the modern yeah. world and add them as new as new data points but yeah we always want more but there are limitations and we also have to to say okay enough is enough at some point point. and if you can <laughs> match an, um, a modern collection with an old description that, um, that would be great too even without the dna comparison so people do that so they say okay this fits really the description we, we have every all the data available for this one we have ITS sequence whatever se other sequences have all the microscopical data the microscopical data so we declare this collection an epitype so we call that a different kind of type it's not the one that the descrip original description is based on but it fits everything and so this can can serve as for the future i guess when you're trying to match some of these older specimens, 
you know, how does a researcher, how do you find that? How do you find if there's a description in an herbarium somewhere that might match the specimen you have? Is there a centralized where you where you get to access that information? Okay, so we look we look first at the literature. We look from which species have been described. So there are liter um, there are are database uh, bases with all the species that have been described. So that's a, a big source you can mine. And then you you look for the herbarium where the original uh, specimen might be. And there is indeed a website now called mycoportal.org where most herbaria in the US have put their data in their database. So it's it's all the collections and then they can indicate whether it's a type collection. So the one on which those descriptions are based, several authors, they are all there, like Harry Tears herbarium in the SFSU is most of the collections there are in it. And the big herbaria of Michigan, where Alexander Smith was, and the one in New York Botanic Garden is in, included, the one in Chicago, mm. and the, far, uh, the Farlow herbarium of Harvard. So the big herbaria are included, so most discovered. There are always collections that are unfindable. And <laughs> Right. It might it might be funny to try to go through and find some incredibly enigmatic fungi described decades ago. <laughs> it might be some might be some fun to be had in those databases, but that's you're fleshing out this process for me more than I've ever really had it understood. Yeah, it, my, it's my own really, mind. I mean you, I mean it's easy to go in the field and say, okay, what is this? Can I identify it? I don't find a name for it. A sequence is I get a sequence, there's nothing in any database. I mean, so it must be new. Well, that is not true. So you have to go to the literature and see whether anything like that has been described from your area. And yeah, there are lots of species described from California, for instance. I mean, right. in all fields, there's more than something like 800 species described from California. Fungal species. Mind blowing. And so many more probably left yeah. out there. But that's. Because we have, yeah, we have, so, have used so many names of other things, of other regions, and they're constantly know how much we don't know <laughs> how much is still to be done and that's and that's the hard work yeah yeah well that kind of puts another key piece to the puzzle that i hadn't thought about you know i myself now as someone who comes from a background of very much amateur foraging looking for things i can eat uh, it's been interesting to try to keep my eyes open and learn about maybe some of the other mushrooms that i'm seeing out in the woods and you always kind of have in the back of your mind hey i might see something really rare or something no one's ever discovered yet. Uh, so it's always interesting to hear the process of actually figuring yeah. that out, you know? Yeah, because that's it really, because when we were just looking, we did a small study on some helvelas, some elfin saddles. Yeah. And they went under the European name Helvella lacunosa, you know, the black elfin saddle, but they're not. They're really different. We have several species and they're everywhere. I mean, you go out, out of mine, I live in Berkeley. Every under every oak tree, there is, they come up. There's this oak variant that is in spring, spring, and then the dark one is really common. You don't need to go really foreign places to find new species in California. Yeah, it's true. In the you know, I used to live in the east part of the Bay Area, and you would see those helvella everywhere yeah. <laughs> during most of the probably <laughs> there were these big ones yeah yeah well it's it's really interesting and in, in, in your mind then because this to me a seminal article about this topic you listed some proposed guidelines and we're kind of nibbling at the edges of that with yes <laughs> check check past data but you know what are your proposed guidelines in this ever in flux you know tons of data coming in how do you make decisions about you know more general groupings for versus more specific yeah, that's about genera, we really want them to be monophyletic. And there was a lot of discussion when we started this. We also want, when, when you propose new genera, that you include in your phylogeny or your, the data you base your decision on as, as many samples as possible of a wide range of wide area, just, just not you know backyard, but a little bit further than that. And we use statistical methods for your tree and to see how well supported these, these branches are. And 
you like to have them strongly supported, but that's not always a possible. But we try to, to, I mean, our guidelines were basically what they are guidelines. So people can take their freedom a little bit to say, so okay, we can, we can follow five or so of them, but this one, it's not totally as strongly statistically supported as we would like. And we also would like to people really look at options. So for me, you can say, okay, I picked this little branch out of my big tree, but what is your left with? Why would you do that? Did you test other ways of, of chopping something up? You can make like your spoons. Do you chop them up by material? Are they all three? You know, are they only for wooden or do you have other spoons? I mean, what kind of criteria do you use? Can you group them in different ways? And is that still okay? Right. Do you like that? What are your arguments for your final decisions? As we discussed before, we would like to see them on more than just ITS. ITS is fine perhaps on species level, but not when you want to do it on, on genus level. And we, we stress peer review publications uh, because there are ways of, of really publishing these things really, really fast. Index for Gorham, just you can say, okay, new genus, this is the description, this is without any background information. So that platform was just recently used to make two new families. There's a list of characters, but if you look, there's not a list of genera that belong to either of these families. And you can think from, well, I have this genus, but it could be in either family. So there isn't enough information there. So we are a little, I mean, it was really an opinion piece and I hope that nobody was really offended by it, but it just make people more think about the ways they do things. Well, it would seem to be like a bold decision to take existing genera, existing species, and then create new family groupings. I mean, I'm, it sounds like people are doing that. People are saying, well, you know, we've examined this genera, yeah. this genera and we're going to group them now in a new family and not keep the old differentiation that they had. Well, in this case, these were a little bit orphaned by, I mean, there was this big white sport family, the tricholoma family, and that has been narrowed down. But then there were all these other groups that were left hanging there. So we have to have this hierarchy of one the species that belongs to a genus, belongs to a family. And there was these things that were, yeah, we didn't have really a structure yet, but without a real phylogenetic background on it, then we still don't know much, but we hope, I hope that there will be another paper that's showing more information on that. So what are the families that you think may be undergoing some change moving forward? You know, some of these fungal families that have inherited orphans that don't fit anywhere else. <laughs> yeah, these white sport ones, and they're probably also still some brown sport. Um, there's just recently a big paper on the Saturella family with the incaps and a new subdivision of the genera. And probably there'll be more like that because people keep carving things up. Right. Uh, and probably also in the the family the Lepiotis belong to, because when we there are a lot of new species and, and genera in Southeast Asia that we had no no idea about. So I described indeed two genera of four species that were just there somewhere in the middle and they didn't fit in any of the existing groups. So yeah, I made new genera. <laughs> And, and I wrote the guidelines after that. <laughs> yeah, so you're someone who has carved up some of our bigger groupings. As you've... Well, it's not, that was not carving up really. This was more like we have these species and they don't belong in any of them. So you know, they were really separate branches. Yeah. I mean, it, wasn't, it isn't an agaricus. It isn't a chlorophyllum. I mean, somewhere there in the middle. Yeah. So what do you do? Well, and I would imagine then with how much we're discovering, you know, every a common theme of this show, and you've said it a couple of times, is how much we have left to know, how many species we likely have left to discover. So it sounds like our current phylogenies, you know, our family groupings and our genera groupings sound like they're in for a lot of changes maybe over the coming decades. And a more advanced genetic sequencing techniques play into that as well. I mean, are we getting to the point now where we're going to start having so much more genetic 
data that could throw a lot of these things in flux? Or is it just going to be the process of discovering new things and people looking at the existing structures more and more, these processes of revision or probably a combination of all? I think a combination, but I think there's, I think the basic structures are pretty solid. And there is a lot of small details that are, and, and there will be many species new described. I mean, Southeast Asia, Africa, South America, there is, there's so much still to do, but the big, changes have already happened. I mean, the new insights about from all these, these hypogea species, they belong in the, they, they are recent developments, they, of not all, but most of them, they are really recent and they belong in these genera, which are basically made up mostly of gilled mushrooms and, and that kind of thing. And that's actually a really good example of a physical trait that would seem yeah. to differentiate the individuals that exhibit that trait. But it's actually an example of convergent evolution, it sounds like, where different genera just adapted the hypogeus structure. Yeah, and then, and you know, they can adapt or, or to not just hypogeus, but also say right? Like Agaricus has these species, which we put in different genera, like Longolanga, Gyrophragmium, and Endotychum, which are all different ways of an Agaricus making a puffball like thing. So, yeah. and, a, and a lot changes, a lot of, I mean, it's a lot of changes. You, you don't shoot your spores off anymore. And also in the spore wall, because spore wall of, of guild mushrooms have mostly are they hydrophilic and a small bit is hydrophobic, but these ones of the powdery ones, they are hydrophobic. So there's a lot of changes, but you can't go back to right. shooting off your spores again. It's a one way direction of these developments. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. But very fundamental things about physiology can be different, and they're actually still related mushrooms, which, you know, I don't know enough about genetics of animals or plants, but it, it seems usually like really ingrained physiological characteristics like that are enough, even when we do the genetics, to keep distinct groups in some other kingdoms of life, whereas it seems like fungi... The physical form almost has nothing to do with That's the a, genetics. Yeah, because all the things we talk about are these fruiting bodies. Yeah, yeah. It's only the small part of the life cycle of, a, of the, the fungus. Sure, it's like different apples on an apple yeah. tree being deformed or... Yep. Yeah. Well, another huge aspect of your work then is in conservation. Yes. And I think yeah. this is an issue everyone is becoming cognizant of. You know, yeah. even when I talk to people in the foraging community, everyone has this concern about conservation and sustainability. And, you know, I think there are different groups that we're seeing now pop up, like in Chile, probably the most famous example for me, at least the Fungi Foundation, who's doing a lot of work to try to map out fungal diversity and f basically build it into regulatory structures to. Uh, have to consider fungal diversity and impacts on fungal conservation. But tell us about some of the work then that you've done in protecting fungi, and then maybe how this work in taxonomy and classification really blends into that effort. Okay, let's start with the, the last part, because, because we started out saying we, you need to know what you have in a certain area. So there taxonomy comes on immediately from, you know, you want to know the species you have. So that's the, the basis, the basis for a lot of other branches of biology anyway. You have to have a name, you want to know your organism. But in, in conservation, it's even more important from which species do you have. And when we have a name for a species, from, then we can look from how is it endemic to the Pacific Northwest or is it occurring all through, through Northern North America and Northern Eurasia? I mean, that is a totally different Way. So you have to have good taxonomy to start with. So that's that's why I'm one of my motivations to do systematics is that without that, you know, there's no conservation issues. We cannot conserve because we don't know what we have. We don't know anything about them. Without a name, you have to have names for your organisms. That's just the basic. Right. And then we have a name, we can look at its ecology, we can look at distribution and traits and all that kind of thing. So that's that's how I, I feel this. So as I said in the beginning, I come from the Netherlands and we have a very strong 
recording project since like the mid eighties, when we did, people really realized that because of air pollution, many of the active mycorrhizal fungi were declining in numbers of fruiting bodies. So we didn't see them fruit anymore. And that came well, because of nitrogen deposition. So that was the impetus to start a recording project to have solid data that can be compared with data from beforehand from notebooks and so all the old data were also included in the database for a reports we could re compare uh, really reports from a certain area from the 30s with a report from the 80s and see how much has diff how much change has occurred so um <laughs> though i said from the netherlands we don't have a strong uh, tradition in eating mushrooms, but we do have a strong tradition in valuing data on organisms. Yeah. So if there's any new development, at least when I left, was the, the developer or whatever has to get all the data on all the organisms for which there are data available in these databases. So it could be butterflies, birds, plants, mammals, fungi. So they had to take these into account when they were doing, they had to be an environmental report on it before right, they survey. could start. Yeah, so that's that's my background. And then, then the last few years I've been included in some of these workshops to propose species for the IUCN Global Red List. There's a project uh, spearheaded by um, Greg Muller and Anders Dahlberg. And I've been to three of those workshops, one with Juliana Fucci was there. So that was really nice to meet her and, and how she really reached out and emphasized education and out and yeah, basically education about fungi and that they are they need to be this separate category. I mean right. animals, plants and fungi. That's in every government's decision, they have to be these three things. And I think we have to adapt that for the US because the US only has on its endangered species list certain kinds of animals and plants, but they don't have any other category. They don't do that. So there are two lichens on the US Endangered Species Act species list under the non-flowering plants. Oh, we're halfway there. No fungi. Oh, the fungi. <laughs> Just two lichens made it. But there are other programs we can use. I mean, there's a natural heritage programs in most states. There's a Pacific Northwest Forest Plan, that forest land, national forest land. Uh, it was drawn up for the protection of the spotted owl. And the spotted owl eats flying squirrels, and the flying squirrels eat truffles. So ah. there was a big survey and management plan in place for mushroom species that are indicative for old growth forests. And it's mostly Washington and Oregon, all the national forest land, and then also Northern California. We also have an emphasis on rare species in California forests, national forests in California. We have a book on that. There's no heritage program in California. That seems to be a travesty. And then also, I have to say that the fungal diversity surveys, the program, uh, this organization, it's recently renamed before that was North American Microflora Project. They also focus now on conservation issues. So I'm glad we can talk about all these different uh, initiatives that are now, there are more of them and the more, more in the foreground. So we had this uh, rare 10 program, so 10 rare species in Western part of the US. So program from October, mid-October, it runs till end of March to look for rare species. We are now moving down with the Northern species we have found most of them, but there's still a lot of the Southern species we haven't found yet. So to so get more information about these species from where do they occur. And it's interesting, one of them, was found in Wyoming, which we didn't <laughs> didn't expect. It's a desert one. It's, a, it's described originally from Nevada, and it's known from the desert. It's one of those things that fruit, probably not that often, but they are woody. You get these, it's a kind of a stalked puffball, and it has a wooden, almost a wooden stalk, and it, that remains for a long time. So 
but under what circumstances it fruits, we have no clue. So it will be interesting to see more of that. So the Rare 10 program, was that through the Fungal Diversity Survey yes. or is that something? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Go to their website. I mean, they have their nice brochures about it, fundis.org. They will send you there. So I'm involved in that. And we're trying to come up with, we're brainstorming about other ways of making conservation, putting that more on the foreground and how to do that. Right. I mean, it's really important that people understand the the importance of fungi in the ecosystem, what they do. It's not just they're there for us. I mean, they're not there for us. <laughs> I mean, that is the first thing that people should Hard realize. for us to imagine, not for humans. <laughs> you didn't know that, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> so so what are they doing and, and why, you know, the ectomycorrhizal species that give nutrients to the tree and get sugars back, the saprotrophs, the ones that break down material, and then the other category that they are detrimental to plant health or other health. But I think most people just don't know that kind of thing and, and yeah. how important they are because they're everywhere, but you don't see them. So that's the really something we have to work much harder on. And one way is um, getting state mushrooms is one way of getting more, more attention to just getting it more into the public awareness, yes. it sounds like. Public awareness is what I would, yeah. So California does not have a state mushroom. Ridiculous. Yeah. Oregon has one. Washington probably has one now. New York, they worked really fast on it. They got one, uh, or they, at least they proposed one. And I'm feeling very happy about it because I gave a talk on conservation there. And I said, well, we should, every state should have a state mushroom. And they got their act together and proposed one. So really nice, nice results of that. California has a state lichen, but not yet a state mushroom. And we have been working on it and getting information from different clubs, what kind of species they would like, but we haven't done the, the next steps still need to be done. And we have to decide on which species to propose and get that. I have a favorite, but you know, everybody has a favorite, so. Well, of course, but what, what do you think the California state mushroom would be? Because I've heard some people murmuring different options. What do you think the California state mushroom would be? I think we should not get an edible species. Okay. We should get uh, the jack-o'-lantern species. It That's blows the one in I've the heard dark. people talk about. <laughs> that was my, my proposal, because it glows in the dark, which is I think is amazing. It gives also really cool colors for when you die with it. A really weird way of, I mean, it gives a lilac. I mean, you don't expect lilac from it. Really? But, I mean, it's so bright orange, you get lilac. <laughs> yeah. And it's really, you put, you put your yarn in a pot and you when it starts getting lilac, you take it out because if you leave it too long, it becomes gray and you don't want that. Oh. It's, it's very tricky, but it is, it's really cool. It's a cool fungus. It makes you sick, but who cares? <laughs> <laughs> it's not always about eating. And you just highlighted something. I think it's so easy to get into it when you think of a state mushroom and why it's interesting. Talk about raising public awareness, like a mascot, a mushroom mascot for every state. Yeah. And you've mentioned a number of different mechanisms or a number of different levels of trying to get fungi more on the map when it comes to conservation. But it sounds like all roads lead to public awareness, whether you're talking about getting more traction on a state level uh, with conservation, with state level conservation projects, or you're talking about the U.S. endangered species list, you know, having the organization that is responsible for that list to expand it, to add the third part of the, the new triumvirate, flora, fauna, funga. I mean, it sounds like all of this really starts with public awareness. Yes, absolutely. Education, 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 and outreach. That's why I'm here. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's absolutely, I mean, yeah. So when we tell people how great mushrooms are, everyone, all listeners, when you evangelize people about mushrooms, you're actually playing a role in conservation efforts. And I yeah. get... Yeah, because if you don't... I mean, the beauty and, and just what I do and, and how how much we don't know about them, <laughs> it's really... Uh, it's it's fascinating. There's so much to learn about them. That's also one thing I always tell people. For, well, we don't know 
We don't know how old to get. We don't know how many sports to get, how many sports are successful, how big an individual is. You can see a mushroom, but that's just a fruit. How big is the underlying tree, the mycelium? All these things and what they do, what do they exactly? Why are there so many of one, sp of one group in one area? What do they different things? Um, there's too much to know, <laughs> so much to know. <laughs> too much to know and their roles, <laughs> like you said, their roles in ecosystems, of course you enter something like end of fights into the con conversation, yep. how much they imbue certain resiliencies to plant hosts that actually allow them to even yeah. exist. I, exactly. I think when I present this idea to most people, you kind of tell people, you know, hey, you know, for some reason there isn't conservation around fungi. I think most people aren't aware of that. I think they would assume that, oh, you know, mushrooms would be protected along with everything else that, you know, those general regulatory or conservation frameworks protect. And I think that's one of the most mind blowing parts is no, they're in the US at least, they're excluded. No, but we need we need habitats preservation, yes. right? Because they are part of a much bigger thing. They are depending on the plants and the trees. So you need, for most, you need habitat. But you can say, okay, for instance, this visual porous, this big polypore, I mean, huge polypore, I mean, that grows on really old, it fruits on really old trees or old snags, you know, standing trees. It turns out that it is present in the younger trees. But if you don't make sure that at some point you will have these big trees for the future, you won't have its fruit. That's the end of the, mm. of the species when you don't have reproduction. Yeah, we need to maintain the fungal nursery environments, if you will. Yeah, yeah, fungal gene pool or something. <laughs> yeah, you, it's, yeah, you need to have habitat for so habitat is not just a forest, but a specific kind of forest with old trees and young trees. And... Well, and in your mind, structurally, what's kind of the best case scenario for conservation? Because, I mean, I did not know that about the Netherlands, that for any development project, you have to do the survey of plants, animals, and mushroom, I mean, every organism. Well, you have to use the data, because yeah, the data are there, but you have to look for the data. So you don't need to do the survey yourself, but you have to be, you have to include the data that the organizations have collected. I guess that would be a critical piece in any kind of adapting this into a regulatory framework for development, let's say, is you'd have to have baseline data on so many different areas that developers could reference. Yeah. And they have to be available. Yeah. Well, and, you know, for environmental projects, having worked a little bit in that field, you know, when any developer wants to do a new building project in the US, or even when buildings are just bought or sold, there are always environmental assessments that have to, usually a developer does have to commission a new environmental assessment. But again, glaringly obvious is that fungi are, are absent from that. So is that, yeah. and I guess what I'm trying to get to is any kind of hierarchy of conservation of what is, what does the goal look like? Or is that going to evolve? And we you know, it's going to be different each country, or is there some idea of here's what the the gold standard, let's say, of conservation protection? Uh, that's really hard to say. Um, I think it just starts with recognition that fungi are an integral part of the environment, that we have to take into account rare species and, and their requirements as much as we know. But the practical, indeed, the practical implications and the, the really acting on it, that is the hard part. I would say still mainly thinking about ways of getting as many data available we have put things on the US endangered species, uh, not on the US, on the IUCN list. And we mostly focused on species in certain habitats that are vulnerable or already the main tree species, for instance, is on the IUCN list, like coastal redwood. But it's hard to get the practical part of it. And I'm not good at that part. And I don't really know 
the, the infrastructure of all the organizations and things that are playing a role in that. It seems really complicated from my perspective. I'm, I'm the one that tries to deliver data and, and make sure that the data that are delivered are good to use. Well, clearly it's complicated and clearly I don't know either. And that's why I'm looking up at Elsa saying, please provide us all the answers for how we can implement your amazing information and the protections. But I guess that all goes along with getting this recognition of their importance as this third leg to be considered flora, fauna, funga. That is so critical because then you get the people who do have this kind of regulatory mindset that understand how the, all those relationships work to then use their imaginations or their knowledge and start finding yeah. and, ways and to... get as many many data on, on occurrences of fungi as possible in a good way in a good accept and accessible database or website or whatever you call it that's the second really important one good data to base your assessments on well and i would imagine you folks who are doing the work that you're doing you know your peers in looking at fungal conservation there must be some heartening signs in how prevalent fungi and mushrooms have become in the U.S. culture over the past, even the past three years. I mean, this radio show is one example of, you know, this outgrowth of interest in fungi and mushrooms, but that must be a good sign for, for your efforts. Absolutely. It is. Yeah. And people who are getting into mushrooms because of one reason for eating mushrooms or whatever, I mean, they go out and they will see more than that. And hopefully they will get really into huge diversity and, and amazing colors and shapes of mushrooms and, and try to learn more. I think and soothing people and making them aware of that's really important. Well, and even making them aware that there is this effort that researchers like yourself are engaged in gives more of a sense of I don't want to say duty, but a more of a sense of, of a bigger contribution you're making. Yeah. And I've kind of yeah. said it for myself. And I know some other hobby foragers, I want to call them, or folks that go out for food foraging have done this as well, is to start keeping your eyes out at what else is out. You know, there's this common phrase, quote, junk mushrooms, which is basically the not edible mushrooms that you're seeing in the forest. We, I, <laughs> I, I know, I didn't, didn't mean to offend you with that phrase, but, but it is, well, you do. <laughs> it, well, it, it is changing that mindset though, to realize like I should, when I go out, even if it's just selecting one or two mushrooms that you find, take pictures, you know, top, yeah. bottom profile, collect the specimen, dry it. Even if you do that once or twice, when you go out with one or two mushrooms, every trip you're out there, even the person who isn't a dedicated naturalist or researcher ends up making a contribution, you can say, okay, I'm actually contributing to this bigger effort to make sure that not only you know that mushroom that I collected maybe is protected, but also that the ectomycorrhizal fungi I love to eat have a better chance of being protected too. Yeah. And putting those data in a database, because if nobody else knows that you have a herbarium, or that you have, that you know the occurrence of these species, you know, those data are gone. They are not taken into account. So please put your data in some way of you know, I naturalist, don't do it on Facebook because it's do it on something that many people contribute to and it's only for nature observations and it's searchable and you can find it. You can search on area, you can find all the fungal species in, found in county or whatever, a smaller area, just do it. Yeah. Yeah, we can't leave it all to Elsa to to do this. We all need to <laughs> no. we all need to contribute. We need endless amounts of observations. And I take great hope in just talking with people like yourselves and seeing this growing movement. You know, it's it's something that I think is well on its way in terms of getting the data we need to integrate this more firmly into our society. So I have a I have a lot of hope for that. You know, I know we've covered then taxonomy and conservation, which are two areas of your research. Any other tenets of your work or main research projects you've worked on that you want to mention, or maybe any future research projects coming up that you want to share with us? No, I just I just would like to say that I really like small mushrooms. <laughs> that is not your question. <laughs> that is a perfect answer to the question, small mushrooms. <laughs> I don't like, I mean, I like species with lots of characters under the microscope. Right. So these big, you know, hygrophorus or tricholoma, they are big mushrooms and they 
they are kind of disappointing when you try to look at them under the microscope, but the small things are really cool. And there are so many small things that are very specific on the substrates. Mm. So these are saprotrophs mostly. It starts with outoscopy, the earpick fung ear fungus. I mean, turn it around and marvel at these, these spines on their knees. Or when you're, I see an old olive tree, look at the, tree, uh, the leaves underneath after a rain, really heavy rain, and there might be this tiny, tiny cryptomorasmias on the leaves, the old leaves, the black leaves of olive trees. I mean, they're, in, they're not native originally in California, but they're here. There are tiny mushrooms on the bark of madrone, on the bark of black oaks that are extremely cool. Open your eyes for the small things. And, and if you have a microscope, use it because, well, wow, it's really cool. I'm starting to think that is a necessity for any mushroom collector's toolkit is to have, you know, a microscope, whether through Amscope or there's so many affordable and accessible options now for, for microscopes. And there is something fascinating about an incredibly detailed organism that small you know, for some reason we think small, but actually there's just infinite amounts of detail in there. Yeah, there's a lot there. Some of them have really cool characters. I mean, these pink sport entelomas, you know, entelomas, they, their spores are cool. They have <laughs> faceted spores, like little boxes. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, so there's so much to appreciate on that microscopic and tiny level. Thanks for offering that. Thank you for offering <laughs> yeah. that perspective to things because I do think we get lost in bigger is better and with fungi. No, 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 small no, is smaller incredible. is much better. <laughs> smaller yeah. is much better. Well, I guess, do you have any resources, you know, where people can learn more about efforts in conservation and then where people can learn more about your work? One thing I would recommend is going to the website of the Fungal Diversity Survey, the Western 10 Rare 10 challenge is still going on. We're thinking about doing a similar one on the East Coast or in the Midwest. So that is one thing where you can actively contribute to the knowledge about rare species. Another one is the place where we propose species for the IUCN red list. And I want to add there that there is a nice, there's a, a video tutorial, but if you want to propose a species for that red list. And it doesn't need to be a rare species because we also want just to assess the risk of extinction for all species. For instance, for all the birds have been are on the list, but not all bird species are endangered or threatened or critically endangered or whatever. So we, the IUCN red list is a, it's an advocacy tool, but it gives you the the chance that a certain species will go extinct. So it's the extinction, the probability of extinction. So species that do fine are also there, but they're saying we're doing fine, least of least concern, no problems. Oh, so you okay. can go there as well. And if you Google IUCN red list fungi, you will get to a site that is a kind of a pre-portal for that. So it is organized by uh, Anders and uh, Greg. That's why we propose them. And then later they can be going on when they've been vetted and more data added to it, they can go to the official site. But that is a long process. I mean, all these things take time and it's sure. not just an easy process to get it into the final database, which, and they also should add immediately about the IUCN list. They have very strict criteria to uh, assess which kind of category this species is in. So it's not just, okay, I think there are lots of difficult questions to answer about population size and number of individuals. And we, we throw our hands up when we don't know these things from mushrooms. So we don't know how long they live. We don't know. But anyway, so there's, there's a lot going on there. But um, you can look at it and contribute in that way. The other way everybody can contribute is from every collection, every species you see in somewhere post it on a website where it is being retrievable and being findable by others. Mushroom Observer, iNaturalist are the two platforms I can think of. We put it on a more informal database, of, which is not a database like, like Facebook groups, then 
they get lost. Right. So I do it in a place where we can retrieve it. That's conservation. On my own, I, I'm active on iNaturalist, identifying species for people when I have the time to tell them why I think it's something uh, rather than something else. I don't have a website. I'm keeping, in general, pretty low profile <laughs> on the web. I can be found on Revelry, which is Facebook for knitters and crocheters. <laughs> 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 I don't think that I can answer mycological questions there. Uh, that's, I think, more or less it. I mean, my papers will be on, are on uh, ResearchGate, which is a place where people's research is findable. That's a good way of finding me. Yes, and luckily you have, you have a distinctive name, so a Google search for Elsa will find you probably voluminous amounts of papers and articles. Well then, I will move to the three questions that I like to ask all my guests. You know, I think some of them are pretty broad and open-ended. You can answer however you want, but the first one might be the most challenging, uh, and that is a mushroom or a fungi that you love and why, and you've named some amazing contenders throughout the episode, but just another mushroom you can think of that you really enjoy and why. Um, it's the, 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 the pleasure of finding things, you know, and I like things on very specific substrates. Mm. So one of them, which we found two years ago, I think is a, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny mycena on the stems of a fern. It's a, a little tiny, tiny is three millimeter cap. Tiny, tiny. Yeah. Tiny, yeah. tiny. But the gill edges are pink of this thing. So that kind of thing is just gives me a thrill finding it, looking for something on these, on the substrate you would normally not go for. It was dry, but the ferns were wet and there they were. You know, you find these things only when there are not these big mushrooms around to, to divert your attention right. to, from the small beauties that are out there. Right. I think, I think in general, it sounds like the small beauties that are specific and almost rare in terms of their substrate are some of yeah but they're i think they're not that rare but it's people just don't look at it yeah and to be honest they are actually easy to find when you know where, where to look for them. tiny beautiful fungi that may typically evade our notice are yeah. some of the favorites of also i love that answer and then <laughs> a much bigger broader question that could be i mean all encompassing so you can go whatever direction you like but what has a relationship with fungi given to you? And that could be how it's affected a career path, perspectives on biology it's offered, you know, spirituality for some people. But what has that given to you? I, I answered this. I, I wrote notes on that. And I would say a lifetime of wonder and curiosity, a further appreciation of nature and its intricacies, lots of things to marvel at and think about, lots of questions I can have and one can ask. And also just in the human realm, just lots of new friends, lots of places to go to, opportunities to travel, see mushrooms in totally different places. I'm really privileged to have traveled to Southeast Asia, to Thailand for mushrooms and China, meeting people, going places. Uh, I'm afraid one gets a reputation of weirdness or being special as well by, <laughs> by doing this work, but that's, uh, that's okay. So yeah, but I think most important is just that it opens your eyes for what's out there. And I'm very glad that somehow I got into it and never got out. Well, you can wear our badge of fungal strangeness with honor and distinction. Uh, because it sounds like it's given you all the things that you could hope for and enriched enriched your experience here immensely. And then another uh, another big question, but what is your greatest hope for our future and our, I mean, humanity, our society, our future uh, and our developing relationship with fungi into the future? Um, I think it is what we were already talking about, that is better understanding and realization of the role of fungi in the environment, that they are not just things to despise because they are ODK or, you know, it's, but they are really essential. Yeah. And that people will take action to include them in their conservation efforts and plans, but also the people who are not, but 
just being aware of them. And I think that's our role of mycologists to open our mouth wherever we are, <laughs> wear our mushroom t-shirts with Sprite <laughs> and talk mushrooms all the time. And, and, you know, with the, I mean, I've been talking mushrooms with the grocery, the, the guy at Trader Joe's at the uh, checkout and the library person, you know, talk mushrooms and, and talk about how weird they are or how amazing they are or i mean shooting off their spores <laughs> talk about that kind of things with people <laughs> what we don't know and yes are open for helping people with identification talk about mushrooms let your neighbors know well, if they have something in the garden they want to know what it is who you are yeah that kind of thing i mean i i really want people to be more aware of what fungi are and what they do beyond those things you can eat or get uh, dead from. Yes, we are on a sacred mission from the mushrooms to end the mycologists like Elsa to spread the word. And that's really an important concept is we don't have to know exactly what the world is going to look like in 50 years as we develop this amazing bond and understanding of fungi. We just need to know that we need to promote that and all these amazing pathways will open up to us as we just spread that knowledge, wear our t-shirts, evangelize people at your local grocery store, and just know that, that you're building a better world based around fungi. Well, Elsa, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing a lot of information. Obviously, there are many, many, many podcasts that we could go over all the different aspects of your work. So thank you for going down this tangent of your work with me and sharing some really important information about conservation. It's really inspiring and you've been a joy to speak with. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. It was a pleasure. It was really nice. Thanks a lot.